do what they are doing. What about students who are ordinary students, who are just Muslim students, attacking their fellow students? What do we call that? It's so painful, so painful. She was stoned and killed because she was accused of blaspheming on a WhatsApp platform where it, they usually post assignments and everything. And because she passed the comment, this girl was stoned to death and burnt in her school premises in the presence of security forces that could not save her. This is very sad in the 21st century. So I always ask the question, apart from the terrorism, why do we have ordinary people who should be educated go this extent? But let me just quickly run to some of the famous attacks that have gone on in Nigeria so that other people will be able to speak. Apart from Deborah, in 1982, a group of Muslims prevented the Anglican Church from building expansion uh, the nearby, of Chukotai, nearby uh, close to a nearby mosque. And so many people were killed that day. In 1991, Muslim protesters stopped the Hadbonkes crusade, and so many people were killed in Kano. In 1995, Gideon Akalaka, a young Igbo trader, was beheaded in Kano for allegedly blaspheming. And his killers were not held accountable to today as I speak. In 1999, in the village of Randi, uh, Randali in Kebi State, a Muslim mob beheaded Abdullahi Umaru, being accused of blasphemy against the Prophet Muhammad. In 2002, Isyoma Daniel article in this day newspaper about the 2002 Miss World Contest to be hosted by Nigeria was seen as an insult to Prophet Muhammad. Violent protests followed, which then took 250 lives of people that are non-Muslims. And that beauty pageant did not hold in Nigeria. In 2005, the publication of a cartoonist considered insulting to Prophet Muhammad led to riots and violence in Nigeria and claimed dozens of lives. In 2006, in Bauchi, Florence Chukuka, a Christian teacher, confiscated a copy of Quran from a pupil reading it during an English lesson. Rioting of, uh, by Muslims led to the death of more than 20 Christians and destructions of their churches. In 2007, uh, rioters in Tudunwada in Kano State, killing nine Christians, burning several churches and destroying the homes and businesses of several non-Muslims. This was because a Christian student drew a picture of Prophet Muhammad. But the Christian student stated that violence, uh, immediately the Christian um, student posted it, then violence erupted and so many people were killed. In 2008, a Muslim mob besieged and set fire to a police station in Yano City uh, in Bauchi. And a Christian woman who had been uh, stoned by a Muslim man took refuge in the police station, but he was also killed because they said, uh, the Quran was desecrated. In 2006, a 46-year-old mother of seven, Mrs. Eunice Elisha, was murdered by an alleged, uh, was murdered allegedly engaging in an evangelism in Banzango West area of Kubwa in the federal capital city. In August 2020, a Kano State Sharia court pronounced the sentences of two alleged blasphemers. One, Yahaya Sharif, whose picture is there. And we have somebody that will speak more about him. Age 22 years, he was sentenced to death by hanging for blasphemy against the prophet. His song was circulated. Okay, this was, um, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, this is um, not, uh, it's the second one. Okay, yeah, it's Yahaya. Yahaya Sharif alleged to be sentenced to death by that court. And also, we have uh, in 2020, his picture is not here, but we have it outside, Mubarak Bala, a Muslim who became an atheist 
is also sentenced to 24 years in prison, accused of blasphemy by posting critical comments on Islam and social media. And in May, on the 12th, Deborah Emmanuel was accused of blasphemy. It's her story that I said at the beginning. Naomi Goni in Borno State is also facing death threats because she posted about the story of Deborah. Fourth July, a 30 year old man was burned to death by a mob in Abuja who alleged him for blasphemy. These are just a few that are documented that I've mentioned, but thousands of people have died in Nigeria. We have to hold the Nigerian government accountable. Nigeria is a democratic, secular state. Apostasy, blasphemous laws must end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gloria. Ms. Shafiq, would you like to join us? Um, thank you very much, and uh, I think so it's off. Oh, no, miss. No, anyhow, uh, in Pakistan, you know that. Uh, thank you very much for speaking about these people who's victimized on blasphemy cases, uh, especially uh, as you know the one woman. And recently, I'm sharing the two incidents of uh, a Faisalabad two staff nurses were accused of blasphemy and the one Sri Lankan issue uh, in Sialkot that he burned alive by, because he is, you know, victimized of uh, blasphemy cases. So uh, Section 25, uh, 295B and 295C carry the death penalty in Pakistan and have been reported to be the most frequently used section of the blasphemy laws. Although death sentence have been awarded in survival cases, there has not yet been a death penalty implementation in Pakistan. The same media sources also indicate that at least 51 blasphemy defendants have been murdered by the public following an allegation of blasphemy, some killed before a case could have been registered against them, some in police custody and other while they were serving prison sentence. And, you know, uh, in previous days, one uh, victim of blasphemy is, uh, you know, uh, is murdered in jail. So here's we need that, uh, which thing we needed to do that, that the cases are, you know, pending in courts. And uh, because of, you know, phonetic elements, the, they could not be heard. Many, many cases uh, are, you know, linger on, linger on and not decided. So uh, it would be, you know, uh, for the different uh, organizations and civil societies and organizations to highlight it, the cases. And then we could be able to solve it soon as the Shugufta's case and uh, Shafkat Emanuel case. So a lot of cases due to this society highlights the issue. We can succeed uh, in these cases. So thank you so much and God bless you all. Okay. It is truly concerning what is happening. And thank you um, both for your tireless effort, which we know um, takes a toll both on you professionally and personally, but we are all standing behind you in this good fight. Um, next, we have a quite a, su a surprise for you to hear from Miriam Ibrahim. She's going to join us now. <laughs> um, so let me share a little bio of Miss Ibrahim. Miriam is well known. She's a well known Sudanese religious freedom activist born to a Muslim father and an Ethiopian Orthodox mother. She was raised in her mother's faith and eventually married a Christian man. Miss Ibrahim was arrested in May uh, 2014 after one of her relatives reportedly accused her of committing adultery for marrying a Christian man. As such is not considered a valid marriage. She was charged with apostasy from Islam and sentenced to death. Um, 
Through her husband's advocacy, she was released. She currently advocates for religious freedom and gender issues and recently authored a book about her life called Shackled, One Woman's Dramatic Triumph Over Persecution, Gender Abuse, and the Death Sentence. Miss Miriam Ibrahim. Thank you, Christine. Um, thank you, Anne. You are truly blessing for all of us. We really appreciate you. And thank you, everyone here today. Okay. Well, I'm going to speak generally because I was told Sudan is no longer an apostasy and blasphemy concerning uh, country. This is a victory. But I will say, here is the problem. We see the list of countries that are um, uh, still uh, have trouble with apostasy and blasphemy law. And um, the fact that we have... I, so the main um, motivation for this law is Islamic Sharia law. It's a fact, it's truth, and cannot be hidden. And a lot of issues that have to come to light in order for us to uh, uh, achieve change. So um, for countries like Nigeria, like uh, Egypt, like uh, Mauritania, so when the legal system is, yes, we, they, this country, they will say, yes, our uh, constitution said that everyone is free to worship and choose uh, because with um, uh, international human rights law. But when it comes to the legal system and how court system work in most of these countries, there's so much power on certain groups, religious groups that have so much power and authorities over the court system, the legal system in these countries. So which is uh, like in Sudan, we have Islamic Fiqh Academy. So when case like that came involved Islam and Christianity conversion, so the court will ask, we go back to this uh, group of, of Islamic scholars to ask for the reference, and then fatwa will come after. And according to the fatwa, the, the sentence for the individual who been charged with apostasy or blasphemy. This happened in my case. This happened in many other cases. Fatwa released, even if the court said no, no charge, nothing. Fatwa released, and a, a different individual, like what's happened with Debra. Debra was killed by her um, fellow classmate. So because other individuals, the mentality of other individuals have an authority over other people's choices. That's, that's the issue with, and this is actually, what happened with Deborah is, is actually is alarm for uh, many of us. We should pay attention to cases like that because why this happened? Because they are a student, classmates sitting shoulder by shoulder. I was, I was in a school, but we, in our education system, that as a religious minority, people of faith, we have to force, we were forced to study Islamic teaching. If you did not, by the Islamic teaching, you won't be able to go to upper grade. So I don't want to go into detail for what is the teaching is about, but everything happened is, is have motivation. So there's a lot of detail that I can share, but I, I was told this is not a place for a religious um, debate. So <laughs> that's not a place for religious debate, but I, I want to share something. I don't know. So I will try. So I know I don't have much time left. Yes, because when I was at the court, uh, no matter what I said, the other thing also, if, if it's involved women, when um, uh, according to Sharia law, women, um, uh, in the case of witnessing for anything, when you have to show up at the court, that's why I was unbelieved. Nada, the one he's, she's facing trial in Sudan now, unbelieved, because at, uh, according to Sharia law, when men equal to women. So in order for the case to make your uh, testimony credible, you have to be two people and you cannot have someone else to testify on your behalf. Like you have, that's why I wasn't questioned. I wasn't allowed to defend myself. So, because that's how Sharia law work in this situation. 
So there is something on Al-Bukhari. That's why the, the reference for the court sometimes and how the court get their reference from Islamic Fiqh Academy. So this might be some of the motivation for so some Zen, uh, Zendega or the athlete were brought to Ali and he burned them. The news of this event reached Ibn Abbas who said, if I had been in his place, I would not have burned them as Allah's messenger forbade it, saying, do not punish anybody with Allah's punishment, which is fire. I would have killed them according to the statement of Allah's messenger. Whoever changed his Islamic religion then killed him. This is one of the biggest motivation. And sometimes this was, they will say, oh, this hadith is weak and is not being taken serious. But um, the Sharia law also, when they, there's not everything is coming exactly from Quran or Sunnah. The court asks for references like Ittihad or, or Asira, or Asira with the life of Muhammad and the Sahaba and what happened and what have they done. And there's many incidents where um, the convert are being killed especially after the death of Muhammad. And as I mentioned this before, there is the biggest, one of the biggest Islamic operation on um, Syria is uh, Harb al-Ridda, which apostasy, uh, apostasy war, Harb al-Ridda. That's how they respond after Muhammad's death, they respond of some Arab um, tribes when they decided not to follow Islam anymore, what Abu Bakr and what um, uh, Sahaba did with them. So thank you, and I hope I didn't uh, offend anyone. Well, I think bravery and courage are definitely some of her um, strong suits. And sometimes when we do that and we step out for um, human rights, we will offend some people. And I think that's OK to have those conversations. Um, yeah. So you might be wondering what the structure of this meeting is, and it's a little bit loose because we are joined now by um, a very special guest from the State Department, State Department um, Ambassador uh, at Large for International Religious Freedom, Rashad Hussein. Um, so Mr. Hussein serves as principal advisor to the secretary and advisor to the president on religious freedom conditions and policies. He leads the state de or the department's efforts to monitor religious freedom abuses, persecution, and discrimination worldwide. He also serves, uh, he oversees policies and programs to address these concerns and works to build diverse and dynamic partnerships with the broadest range of civil society and equitable and meaningful inclusion of faith actors globally. Mr. Hussein, Ambassador, we're really excited that you're joining us today. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's, it's really an honor to be here with you and to see so many uh, of our friends and partners and allies. Uh, I've worked with so many of you already in the few months uh, that I've been on the job, and your work really is essential. And I... <clears throat> Uh, I'm very encouraged to see the campaign that you have uh, going on uh, around the world. Uh, it's a, a set of issues that I feel very strongly about as well. Um, when I began um, in government, I came in as an attorney. So, um, you know, my training is uh, a training which uh, in, one in which we cherish our First Amendment principle, uh, freedom of religion, which we ver take very seriously any attempts to restrict those freedoms, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and the other freedoms that are guaranteed to us uh, in our Bill of Rights. And I came into the uh, government as an attorney in the Justice Department in the White House Counsel's Office. And when I came to uh, the diplomatic world, <clears throat> one of the first assignments that came to my desk was on a resolution that was being passed every single year at the UN uh, called the Defamation of Religion. And this was 2010. And I was told that we want to get, we want to move past this religion with this uh, resolution, uh, at the defamation of religions resolution, and uh, either we can eliminate it entirely or we can come up with an alternative. And so one of the questions I asked was like, what are people actually trying to achieve with this resolution? They said, well, there's a number of well-intentioned people that are really concerned that um, there is actions taking place around the world which uh, involve uh, language and uh, speech and other activities that's very offensive to the world's 
uh, religious faiths and traditions. But the problem is that uh, such an instrument that was being passed at the UN gave sanction to blasphemy laws and apostasy laws. And those laws are oftentimes used to target religious minorities because their viewpoints and their faith traditions are seen as blasphemous. Um, and they're used to go after uh, uh, political opponents uh, uh, in, in many cases. And so what we tried to do was say, let's try to preserve the underlying well-intentioned principles of some people. So we came up with an alternative, which is now known as 1618, which attempts to address underlying causes of intolerance, uh, supports educational programs, but moves away entirely from the criminalization of speech as a way of trying to address this problem. And so he went one by one, every ambassador, uh, particularly from the OIC countries. I was the envoy to the OIC at the time. Um, at, I remember meeting with them one by one, actually met with them in groups of five or six uh, over meals in Geneva and explaining why this resolution is actually counterproductive. You know, simple things, different audiences were making, you know, the same fundamental human rights arguments from a policy perspective. It's often the case that when you have laws that try to criminalize speech, that that speech just becomes more amplified, right? So if somebody makes some offensive cartoons, no one's really going to know about it. Not many people are going to care. But the second you try to arrest somebody and it becomes a news story, then all of a sudden those cartoons are being broadcast all over the world, right? So from, from a policy perspective, even, it doesn't even protect the equities that you're trying to protect. So really one by one dealing with all these countries. In the last country we, we you know, I met with, uh, with Pakistan and the ambassador here, Ambassador Haqqani at the time, and right in front of me had a conversation directly with the president of Pakistan who said, yes, let's go ahead and support um, Resolution 1618. That's one international resolution. Now, we have many countries around the world that still unfortunately have these laws on the books. And so as we travel to these countries and I meet with their ambassadors here in the United States or as they're visiting, uh, visiting us, we raise these questions. Uh, we raise the we raise these policies. Um, we raise individual cases. You know, we've talked about the Mubarak Bala case. We talked about, you know, unfortunately the 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 most recent killing of De uh, of Deborah Samuel in Nigeria. Um, uh, and we directly address those cases with the Nigerian government. We're working very closely with civil society. So this is an important area uh, for me. It's an area I've written about um, in a, in a law review article um, opposing blasphemy laws. Uh, and we're going to continue to do this work, um, God willing, but with your help. I mean, it, civil society has really been on the front lines of this effort, not only on because of your advocacy, but sometimes we hear about the most problematic policies and cases directly from you first before we hear them elsewhere. And so when we get that heads up from you, it allows us to try to get ahead of the situation when we're talking with government. So I appreciate everything that you're doing. I look forward to continuing uh, to partner with you. And please, you know, I, I urge you to be in touch with us, with your ideas, and also to help correct us. You know, if I'm, if I'm not doing what I need to be doing in my job, or if I'm getting something wrong, I want to hear from you so that we know how to get it right. So thank you so much. How many times have you heard a sitting leader say something like that? <laughs> I would love feedback. If you could please let me know what I'm doing wrong, I'd love to hear from you and correct efforts. If that would happen in our marriages or in our town, I think that would be amazing. Um, so the general structure for the session was um, the application of apostasy and blasphemy laws, where you were able to hear stories of survivors and victims. Um, the second section is what can we do? Like now that we know that this is a problem, what can we do about it? So we're attempting to share with you best practices and then what are state efforts and then parliamentary efforts. Now our two um, parliamentary uh, Stakeholders, um, which are Chairman Raskin and Senator Langford, are not able to join us. Congress is out of session right now. And if you've seen the news lately, you've seen that Chairman Raskin is quite busy <laughs> doing wonderful work. Um, so right now, I'd like to, to call up uh, Commissioner Curry. I'll give you a second to give up here by reading um, your bio, sir. David Curry is the president and CEO of Open Doors USA, an organization that advocates on behalf of those who are persecuted for their Christian faith throughout the world. 
For nearly a decade, he has provided leadership to Open Doors in its mission to raise awareness and support for those that endure extreme restriction and in some cases, horrific violence for practicing their faith. Um, Mr. Curry is also now the USERF commissioner and we are very excited to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is a, this is an important legal issue. It's an issue for the government. For me, it's an issue of the heart. I, I think back to a couple that was uh, in prison for seven years in Pakistan for apparently sending a tweet in a language they didn't understand that they were illiterate in. And in that picture of the injustice, the, the vigilante justice under the guise of law is really what motivates me and animates me on this subject. So I'm just grateful to be with you today and honored to be part of this discussion uh, as part of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. It's a group, as you know, that's a bipartisan advisory body which monitors religious freedom worldwide using international standards. And the repeal of blasphemy and apostasy laws is one of you, sir's top priorities. It's the fundamental aspect of religious freedom and belief. However, across the globe, as you know, 84 countries maintain blasphemy laws, and at least 23 countries have laws that penalize acts of apostasy. It's shocking. And our analysis at USER found that every identified blasphemy law, every single one deviated from one or more internationally recognized human rights principles. More blasphemy laws, even those that impose criminal penalties, were vaguely worded. They're not even clear. They don't require intent as an element of the crime. And they carried unduly harsh penalties for violators. So religious freedom... It includes the right to express a full range of thoughts and beliefs, including those that some people might find offensive or disagree with. So apostasy laws are also inconsistent with international human rights standards as they fail to recognize fundamental rights, including the right to change one's mind, to change one's faith or religion. And they're meant theoretically, to protect the membership of a, of a religion, but it's at the expense of the freedom of religion or belief. While all blasphemy and apostrophe laws are problematic, the imposition of the death penalty for these crimes is particularly egregious. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights provides that death sentences may only be imposed for the most serious crimes. The use of a death penalty for nonviolent acts, including blasphemy and apostasy, which we're talking about today, it constitutes a violation of international human rights law. The severity of these laws that are on the books is just the beginning of the story. USERF research has found that there are 674 cases, 674 cases, of state enforcement against alleged blasphemers in nearly half of the 84 countries with criminal blasphemy laws. The six countries with the highest number of cases, Pakistan, Iran, Russia, India, Egypt, and Indonesia, they're all countries that USERF has identified as the worst violators of religious freedom. Pakistan and Iran are among the countries that impose the death penalty for, for blasphemy, which makes for the high rates of enfor enforcement particularly alarming. Researchers also found that Pakistan had the highest rate of mob activity, violence, vigilante threats, and attacks related to blasphemy accusations, which demonstrates how vigilantes are emboldened by the severity of these laws. We unequivocally call upon all countries to repeal blasphemy laws. And we particularly implore states where there's no active enforcement to take immediate steps to remove these laws. Half of the 84 countries don't even enforce these laws actively. Take the step to abolish them. 
because the abolishment of dormant blasphemy laws acknowledges that such provisions violate international law. And to repeal them, these inactive blasphemy laws, can help build positive momentum towards repeal and reform. USURF has recommended that the U.S. government prioritize freedom of religion or belief in the U.S. engagement in the U.N. human rights system. But beyond calling for the abolishment of all blasphemy and apostasy laws and the removal of the most egregious penalties, the U.S. government can also advocate for religious prisoners of conscience who are imprisoned under blasphemy provisions. My partner at the at USURF, Commissioner Fred Davey, has advocated for the release of humanist Mubarak Bala, uh, who was mentioned by the ambassador, and for the gospel musician, a Muslim gospel musician, uh, Yahya Sharif Aminu, who are both prisoners detained on charges of blasphemy in Nigeria. Mr. Bala, who is the president of the Humanist Association of Nigeria, was sentenced to 24 years in prison for peacefully expressing his views on social media. A state-sanctioned a state Sharia court in the Kano state of Nigeria sentenced uh, Yahya Aminu to death in 2020 for committing blasphemy in a private WhatsApp message. The higher court quashed the death sentence and ordered the case to be retried, but Mr. Sharif Aminu remains in detention USURF has highlighted religious prisoners of conscience on its freedom of religion and beliefs victims list, including several individuals who are now on death row and, and for blasphemy. We must continue to shine a light on these victims of blasphemy laws and call for their release. I thank you again for inviting me and joining me. I look forward to further discussion on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great, Commissioner Curry, thank you for your work. Um, okay, so in keeping with state actors, we're bringing up another um, state actor. So the Director of Religious Coexistence at Ministry of Endowments and Religious Affairs. It is an honor to have you here, sir. Um, His Excellency Amir Othman Mawal is not in the room, but might be at some point. So we're going to shift. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's shift a little bit. Okay. Thank you all for being flexible. You're a wonderful team. Let's see here. Okay. So how about Cola? Cola's here. <laughs> now would be a great time for you all to take out your cell phones. And type in your text message, 855-549-0168. Do I sound like I should be on a... <laughs> text IRF to 855-549-0168 so that you can sign on behalf of yourself or your organization um, our charter for the United Nations General Assembly taking place in September. One more time. 855. I should put this up. 549-0168. You can text IRF. It's going to send you a link, and you can sign there on behalf of yourself or your organization. Can you do it one more time? Yes. <laughs> For those in the back, um, it's 855-549-0168. Text the letters IRF. It will send you a link so you can sign on. Okay. Mr. Kola Alapini is a defense attorney for the now 24-year-old Nigerian prisoner of conscience and gospel singer, um, Miss Sharif Aminu, who was sentenced to death for alleged blasphemy by a Sharia court in the Kanu state of Nigeria. He also led the legal team that got a 10-year sentence of a 16-year-old minor squashed. Both young lads were sentenced by the same Sharia court by the same judge in August 2020 in the Kanu, North Nigeria. The Appellate Division of Kanu State High Court squashed both convictions. It is an honor to have you here, sir. Thank you for joining us. Please take your full time. Okay, so I'm going to start from a very strange position. Um, I'll be advocating... Uh, acting as devil's advocate for my country, Nigeria, 
which I know have got a lot of bashing uh, recently. Nigeria does not practice apostasy anymore by virtue, so the speaker that spoke the first time um, needs to update her records. By virtue of section 38 of the Nigerian constitution of 1999, apostasy has been um, effectively removed from our laws because section 38 says that you have a right to religion you have a right not to have a religion and you have a right to change your religion so constitutionally apostasy does not exist in nigeria anymore so i haven't started from that strange um, position eventually if i forget please remind me i will also be ending it on a strange note by tying it up let me introduce you to mr yaya bin sharif my client that's him over there um He's a very shy lad. He made the poster because he got a death sentence. <laughs> There's someone who didn't make the poster. Um, who it appears that we're always forgetting to talk about. And his name is Omar Farouk Bashir. Uh, Omar Farouk was a 16-year-old who was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment by Sharia court uh, in filling hockey. Filling hockey is an outside world for Hockey field um, um, in, in Kano, northern Nigeria. And um, Yaya got the death sentence. Both of them were sentenced the same day by the same judge in Sharia court. There was no legal representation. Um, they, had, um, they had been taken to court about two or three times before then. And the Sharia court is usually a court of summary jurisdiction. They just want to get you out of the way quickly. And the, the judge had asked the state to produce a lawyer on behalf of the two young lads. But nobody in northern Nigeria was going to step forward. If you step forward, you'll be killed, or your office could be burned, and you'll be run underground. And the Muslim community also said, no Muslim lawyer must step forward to defend these people. Um, there's a 30-day gap from when the sentence has been given and time was taken away. I'm just going to speak a little on it because I understand I have about 10 minutes today. But um, if you keep a date with us tomorrow, um, room 16, 1230, I think, you would hear more about this case. So um, what have we done? What, well, what would we do? During the COVID-19, I mean, a group of us uh, got together on a WhatsApp group out of boredom. Um, there was nothing to do. <laughs> it was a lockdown. And we were talking about uh, religious freedom and all that and, you know, thinking of what to do. And... Okay. Okay. So we, we out of boredom, we, we all got together and we were chatting, you know, WhatsApp chats and um, with a particular focus on religious freedom, what do we do? Section 10 of the Nigerian constitution says uh, the federal government or the state government must not promote, uh, or must not adopt any religion. So how come we have 12 northern states in northern Nigeria practicing Sharia law and it seems as if they are usurping the constitution? So we, we were just you know, debating like moot courts, you know, and then these cases came up. So we were prepared. Um, battle ready. I, I studied international human rights law in the UK almost 20 years ago, and I was called to the bar almost 20 years ago. So it was um, a privilege to be able to practice what, what I had studied. I was, um, I was raring to go. So how did we go about it? Um, I live in Abuja, which is right in the center of Nigeria. It's 40 minutes away from Kano. And um, once the lockdown was, you know, east, we were able to travel incognito, wearing no masks, dressed like a northerner. I had a different cap to this one, almost similar to what Yaya was wearing, so I could blend it perfectly into northern Nigeria life. I understand the smattering of our I've been schooled for four years in northern Nigeria. Now there's a mistake that we usually make um, when we're talking about this, is uh, religious cases. There would be gatekeepers in those communities, and you must be very careful not to alienate them. The people who made our work easier were Muslims. Muslims who didn't like what was going on. We have a very strong and powerful law school network, of which I am 
one of the admins. So we had boots on ground and we activated and felt out the friendly ones amongst them who would lead the way. Um, they didn't want their names to come up in the processes which were filed because, of course, that would be dangerous to them. But some people opened the door. They were not spirits. They're human beings mm -hmm. and they are Muslims. Okay, but they don't like what's going on. But they can't even be seen to associate with us. But of course, like I said, wearing the KN95 mask helped. So we bled. <laughs> nobody knew who we was. I kept a longer beard to look like a Muslim. And then off we went. So we filed the first appeal on the 3rd of September 2020, just days away from Equal Having killed, because the governor said, I'm going to sign the, I'm going to sign the, um, the debt papers. It was whilst I was filing Yaya's um, papers in court and the court officials were discussing about this notorious judge, the, the Sharia court judge, that I found out there were actually two sentences that same day. And we had forgotten about Omar Farouk. But because he got the death sentence and the dates were sticking away, Yaya's case took precedence internationally, or at least in the news. So when I go back to Abuja and we did our strategy meeting again, all this going on by WhatsApp, you know, uh, a couple of friends there who went to law school together were not seeing each other in 20 years, okay? And then a few other people of um, like minds. It's, uh, we were all strange bedfellows, Christians, Muslims, atheists, everybody who just wanted to be able to speak for religious freedom. And that's why I'm saying you have to be very careful not to alienate people of the other side or who do not have any faith. You will, you will need them. Anyway, um, so we sat down and, hey, we for, forgot someone in Kano. Who's that? There's a young lad there. He's serving 10 years. <sighs> what do we do again? So we had to raise funds. Four days later, I was back in Kano, incognito, to file the appeal for Omar Farouk, the 16-year-old, he was, he was wrongly reported in news as being 13, but he was actually 16. When, that was one of the questions we got to clarify when I, we got him out of prison. So we got back and um, what do we do? How do we push this to the international community? The use of new technologies first. Oh, I forgot. There's, one, there's a friend of mine who's a journalist. He's also running for president in Nigeria. I don't think he's going to win, but <laughs> 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 it's the second time he's running. He runs a very um, popular online um, online publication called Sahara Reporters. He comes from my mom's village, so uh, and I've defended him in court a couple of times, so he's my very good friend. He's been charged to prison by the Nigerian government. Uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, sure. He knows. He knows what I feel. He's been, he's been, he's been charged for treason for about three years. He <laughs> comes out in and out of prison. I'm on his legal team, so, uh, you know. Um, I, I, I told him to be very modest about his presidential ambitions, but, you yeah. know. Anyway, he gave me one of his um, foot soldiers in Kano who, who, who joined people, the boots on ground. So as a favor to him, I give him the scoop and say, hey, I'm giving you one hour to break this news. If you don't break it, I'm going to take you to CNN and BBC, and that's all. So by the time I was going to get on the plane, he had broken the news, and everything sort of went viral from there. Oh, Nigeria sentences, the 13-year-old boy, oh, this one to death. So that was it. And then CNN found me on Twitter and LinkedIn and um, um, wanted to do a story. Omar Farouk being a minor, the story blew, went more viral than Yaya's own. Because I would have, who, who sentences a 13-year-old to 10 years imprisonment? So we must have done like 50 or 60 um, news stories, Washington Post, New York Times, BBC, everybody, Dr. Vela, everybody was on the Nigerian government's spot. So... <laughs> Excuse me, French. So the, the Nigerian government, um, they didn't find it funny at all. The president summoned the governor of Kano State, um, Ganduje, to the presidential palace, um, flurry of activities. These cases usually end up stuck in court. You're not going to get anything out of it. Well, Abu Barak has been stuck in the court process for like three years now or so, and so many others. The use of new technologies, Twitter, Facebook, the international news 
advocacy, our friends, Jubilee and everywhere, everybody kept on tweeting and retweeting. The Nigerian government doesn't like that. So we got a very quick date for the appeal. Um, the court quashed the sentence of the minor completely and set him free. And then, you know, they held on to him you know, to serve as a deterrent. And the court said so as well. So, you know, Sharia law is here to stay. It preserves the life and um, culture of the people of northern Nigeria. Um, there were a couple of grounds which we, which we um, challenged, which we used to overturn the conviction. In Omar Farouk's case, well, the, the most important one is a, is a minor. It shouldn't even be in an adult's court in the first place. Second one was that there was no legal representation. And third one, especially in Yaya's case, in addition to those two points, was um, if you have a, a, an offense in Nigeria that is punishable with a death sentence, even if you say, hey, I'm sorry, um, just convict me, let me go home. The, I'm guilty. The court should enter the plea of not guilty. It was not done in this case. So, right, and then we challenged the, the Sharia vis-a-vis um, -vis the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And that's where we are now. We're now at the second highest court in Nigeria. Well, we finally argued the appeal last week, Thursday. We got on the plane and I'm here before you. So we hope that the appeal court would be able to find in our favor as regards um, the constitution of Nigeria being supreme. And I said I was going to end on a strange note. Then the United States government decides to remove Nigeria as a country of concern. Isn't that strange? When I met these guys at the as Yusuf and all this, so what, what, when um, the Secretary of State came to Abuja, I was in the August location, and in the evening, we had this news, and I was wondering, what, what's going on with the U.S.? And you can see a direct correlation. When the U.S. removed Nigeria, the killings have spiked. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we have two more speakers for you today. Oh, wonderful. Welcome. We were just talking about you, and we're so happy. <laughs> okay, give me just one second to find that page. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go maybe 15 more minutes, um, maybe less. We'll see. Um, so right now we have... Um, we have Director of Religious Coexistence at the Ministry of Endowments and Religious Affairs um, from the Kurdish Regional Government joining us. His Excellency Amir Othman Malwood. Perfect. Come up. Join us. Zor Spas, Kafir نرمان بيان خان كسفير من الله ولاتي واشنطن لقل دكتور صلاح ولقل زنابيش تان بدي اللي جيها توين وخو من خوش حال لزاين لقل برس كاك دسكو من باسي دمي باسي تجربة بكم لسر بابتي religious freedom لسر بابتي آزادي آيني شتاشي بتسوكم ببيري هاتو كاتي خوي دو هزار وشاز ده لقل برس بيان خان كان يوناري حكومة اللا واشنطن لا وزاري خارجي أمريكا بوين داعش دهات هجومي سر عراق و منطقة كاني ده كرد و پيش مرقا كان من دفاع يعني لا پيكاتا كانو آزاد يعمل لكردستان باسي آزادي آيني من ده كرد لمنطقة كاني تر 
اقتحامی او شنا نه دکرا براستی یعنی حسمان دکر لکات گیم باسی آزادی عینی دکن لکات چیش بابتی ارهاب و تیرو هات نه منطقه کار من داجیان سوری Oh, get him, Wima. They say that uh, when we talk about the coexisting, it has a, like a small story. Then in 2016, he was here in the United States. Then they were like a, have a meeting with the Ms. Bayan, and were they talking about the religion freedom? At that time, was Kurdistan has been attacked by the ISIS, so the Peshmerga was like a fighting for freedom for all the components in. زور با کرتی رنگ مدتی یعنی ماوی قصه کردن کم زور کم به اما چی من کرد ولی ماوی سال سالی رابر تو که حضوری اساسی بابتی ریلیجس فریدم چون درست بوده و چون تا استه نامانه. او گران کاریانی که ل ل لو ما وی که خیره روی دو. اما ل عراق دستور منه دستوری عراق دستوری که ک واضحه ل عراق یا کان و استادم وی هندک سر قلم باز بکم هندک زار رجیه ل مسئله تدیون هندک زاری رجیه ل مسئله حری تدیون. And as you know, we are part of the Iraq, and the Iraq's constitution have some articles. We will try to mention some of those articles which like a be stop us to not doing like to not improving more than what we have now. طبعا دستوری عراق دستوری شی زور زور باشه از ما ایله سربو اگر وکو خوی زیبا زیبا کری. Say as a general Iraq's constitution it's it's really good if they apply perfectly all articles. لا دستوري عراق وهاتوا ك مثلا حريمي كردستان اما ريليجس فريدم معناها بلا ناو راس خوارو عراق ببي دستور يعني حريتي معتقد يعني هي زيوازكي اما لحريمي كردستان لقل حكومتي عراقي بوشويا والله we are a part of Iraq which is recognized by the by the Iraq's constitution and we are have a religion freedom in, in our part, but the north and central of the Iraq, they don't have such kind of the virgin freedom. يعني ديمو ناو هيكلي تنظيمي وزارت كإما سرپرشتي لانا رسميكي كأرجي داكين بو سرپرشتي كدني إداري ريليش فريدم. And I'm talking about the structure that we have in the religion affair in KRG, how they manage religion freedom. یا کم شد اما بدو قنق باسی ازادی اینیم که لحیر میکنن یا کم شد وکو کلتور دوم شد وکو لعنتی یا سایکا. Say we have two steps that we did. First, the culture was supporting religion freedom. Then second, as a law, we we like organized the religion freedom. اني برزا مثلا ما لا بير ما نسي ما لا كردستان لناو صار دوري يعني اجرين بركانين اما كاتي باسي ازادي اني لكن پشمان بستو با كلتور و ياساكاني هرمي كردستان as you know we are in Kurdistan surrounded by the many like the danger countries and we have a religion freedom based on our culture and our law which has been issued in KRG يملا تنصالي رابردو هزار دوستة كيلومتر زيراني دا عجبوين. And as you know, we have 1,200 kilometer. We were neighbor with the ISIS. They were ISIS were attacking us. أباست يملا قال هذه هاو بيمان لبري همو الدنيا شر مانكر دفاع من لا أزادي أيني همو بيعاتا كانكر. They say, as you know, we are fighting instead of the old war to to destroy that terrorist group. و او یاسانی که لنا وزارت یاسای برکارن یاسای جمعر پیانز معنی قانون حمایت الادیان و المکونات قانون که بعد یه چی دستوری هیا And we have the law number 5 2015 issued by the Iraq's parliament Kurdistan parliament and it's talked about the the rights of the old components in 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 Kurdistan اما قد ما قناغی یکم باسی بابتی کلتور بانگر لقناغی دوام استا بیاسا تنظیمی ازادی آینی پیکا و جان کرده ولی کردستان. باش بودیم نه دنچی خوب. Okay, I said that's the first. We we say that the Kurdish culture was supporting the 
religion freedom. Uh, this is like a long history about it. That's the all the components in Kurdistan. They like to live peacefully with each other. Then the second the parliament, Kurdistan parliament, they issue in that law, which was give us like a legal steps to to work on religion freedom. Yeah, so I can't take it away the cat or come and say as I need the Kurdistan. ما في همو تاكاكاني ناو كومالغا وما في همو كوماني تاكاني ناو كومالغي كردستانو وحكومات بلايا ولا لان خوش معنا وقواني كوماني تينا ما في ام باريز راوا So according to the law number 5 2015 that's confirmed that's all individual person in Kurdistan they have a rise to practice their religion freedomly uh, and uh, the government will, will protect them I am an Estaxadakam Xaya, Yan Awata Bakridarwa Mankardua. They say the things that we say today is not just the words, sentence, that's in reality we did that. Lamawi Dajikari, Hezi Yani Groupi Tirurisi Daash, Ka Ziatrilla, Iraq, Suria, Liberdes Bubble, and Opanta, Ledamulio Masahaki, Emela Kurdistan, Baushman Labu Hamu Awara Kankardu, Kadu Mulion, New Awarella, Baushi Homan Manger. So as you know, the ISIS were in Syria and Iraq for the very like a big area, and at that time we 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 obtained more than two million and five hundred refugees from different parts in Kurdistan. Our Akani Kurdistan, Tanawa Izori, our Awarani Kahatna Kurdistan, Tanawa Izori Tedabu, Turkmani Tedabu, Shiai Tedabu, Sunni Tedabu. مثلا شبكي تيادابو مسيحيبو ازيديبو زوربي اقوامو يعني نجادا كان همو يروان لكردستان كرد اي كردستان در جاي لسر پش كردو بو همو او كما نتوا يعني بو همو او مانورت يعني كرويان لحريب كردستان كرد They say the Kurdistan opened all his gate for, for all the components in Iraq nations and religions Arab, Sunnah, Shia, Turkmen, Christian, Ezidi all of them they were became a safe in Kurdistan مثلا لمنطقة كاني بغداد وجنوب وناوراست كنيسة كان ده تقن رأي هو يا ملك كردستان كنيسة ما بو مسيحية كان دروز ذكر. In in central and south of Iraq they were like church blown up by the tourist group but in Kurdistan we built a church for them. نكهر العراق ناوس ناوراست وخارو العراق لا بر بلكو اللي دورو بريش مان إما سياسة وفلسفة إنتجريشن ممارسة دكين لا حكومة يعني من كردستان بلام بيت سوانا لما منطقة سياسة أسيميلا مثلا ممارسة ذكرية. Said that in Kurdistan, if we compare to the all our neighbors, that's we we obtain the integration, integration, yes, philosophy and the others they will have what. Jakari, Esmili, Smelisha, Esmili the Kren, and Iwani the Ruberman, Bale. Any Emma Book Aichi, Zugrafin, Yan, Lenau, Roshalatin, or the Middle East, Barasi, Emma Ham, Homan, Okulani, Rasmi Hokumet, Paris Gari, Lamafi, Takbatach, Community Kandaka, Ulaman Katija, Oku Kultur, Emma Swahar Swarman Kurdin, Lerpians, Man Kurdin, Lera Danishtun, but Rajaim Yazu, Masihi, Turkman, Syrian. اقوى مكاني تر ازيدي زردشتي صابي اه حتى ازن صابي او بهاي كان او انا براسي يعني وكو نان دعني بلان اوارن تكا حتى كردستان مالو شوينو زيدي خوي انا بلام لهمان كاتشا لرابردو او انا نبون بلام استا لقل لرابردو تون او انا كا كومونيتي كان لقل من جاون استا زياتيريش او انا او انا كا استا لناو مانن لقل من دجن با اشتي The small part of the world our country is small part and surrounded by many, many of the problems, but we have a many, many components that weren't exist in Kurdistan, but they are exist now, like Asabi and Mandai and Bohai. They were in other parts of Iraq now. They are existed in Kurdistan. And we say in that, that's, as we said before, that was a culture supported now is legally supported as well. استبانه من کمیتی به هایی کن نظرم اگر ایو شهر زایتان هی لسر پکاتی به هایی آینی به هایی به هایی کن ل رشلاتی ناوراز براسی هست وضعیت زور زور خرابه بلام ل کلستان شونیان هی مرکزی ثقافیان هی عبادت دکن و ممثلی رسمیان هی لایم او کوزارت کو حکومت. They became illegal religion in other parts of Iraq and Iran, but now in Kurdistan they are 
free, they, they participate their religion, even they have a like a formal representative in the Ministry of Religion Affairs in Kurdistan. و او یاسایی که یاسای جمعه پنزی سالی دو هزار و پازده یاسای پارسنی ما فی پکاتا کن ابعادی زوری تدا فلکسبلا یعنی تو دتوانی زورتر و زیادتر او محیط فراوانتر بکی بو مسئله ازادی آینی پکاتا کن لکرستان That's meaning that others they can be exist as well in Kurdistan. Oh, Dr. and Dr. Salah, who is a member of the Kurdistan Committee, has been a member of the Kurdistan Committee for the past few years. And the Kurdistan Committee has been a member of the Kurdistan Committee for the Ministry of Religion, <laughs> civil activity, I'm working in the private sector. But he mentioned something that me and uh, Dr. Salah, we are coming here. This is type of the coexisting because I'm not Muslim. I'm Yarsani, I'm Takis, I'm following Yarsan religion. And those people are Muslim. They say this is a symbol. And they decided to open uh, like a formal office for all religions inside the religion uh, affair. اما سفیر من نونری رسمی من بیان خان که اگدسکو لولاتی امریکا او تجربه جوانه و نموزه زفریده که لکردستانه همو جاره ترجمه ایده که دایدین اوان اوانی لری کنال رسمی کنی خوان با عالم و با محفل کن لدن organization as well they write and reports on us and we deliver it and you can read it more about that من نظام تندم کات ماو بوی لسر بابتی گورینی آین قسیق بکم زور باشه طبعا اما لکردوسان زورینی زوری کردوسان و بتابتش عراق یعنی مسلمان بلام لنا وتکانی تر بداخو کا هندک جار پیشلی ما في پیکات کنن کمی نکند دکریت است نتوانم بگرند نوسر شنی خوان بالام لکردستان به پیت سوانا و حقی توابی ممارسی یعنی حقی موطنان هیا دتوانن مافوجیانی ان پارس را به. Which is available for all believers. Oh, how much the government has to do for the government? For According to the our ministry, so we don't support or we, we don't like uh, encourage anybody to convert their religion. But if they did, they are really free to do that, and it has a legal support for that in Kurdistan. Well, I could tell you that it's a very important thing to do, and if you have a good idea, I'm going to give you a good idea. Sir, I'm really thankful for all of you and for having me here. And if you have any question later, I will answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to move quickly into an advocacy portion. Um, I'd like to bring up uh, Mr. Mohammed Syed, a uh, human rights activist, writer, speaker, and community organizer. He is the founder and, ex and president of Ex-Muslims North America, the first ex-Muslim advocacy and community building organization in North America. Mohammed has been a human rights activist for the past decade with a focus on efforts to normalize religious dissent and promote acceptance of secularism in Muslim communities. Welcome, sir.
Hi, um, my name is Muhammad Sayyid. I'm the president of ex-Muslims of North America. Um, Muhammad, the atheist, is something that I'm known for, which causes a lot of grief to those that oppose me. Um, I'm joined here with Elena Fowler, our legislative policy associate. Um, ex-Muslims of North America was founded in 2013. Our mission is to advocate for acceptance of religious dissent, promote secular values, and to reduce discrimination faced by those that leave Islam. Um, we focus on four main fields of work, advocacy, research and monitoring, public awareness, movement building and support. For this audience, I will highlight the two most relevant, advocacy and monitoring. Um, we have three main legislative priorities. The one we're talking about right now is global repeal of blasphemy and apostasy laws. Um, we also work to protect freedom of speech online for uh, a lot of dissidents. Uh, on, being able to speak online is the only means available to them. Um, for community building, for organizing, uh, for la having lines of communication for emergency support, uh, being able to talk online is vital. Um, lastly, we call for measures that lift barriers to ex-Muslims seeking asylum um, and refugee status in the U.S. Um, we hope to work with many of you here to achieve those goals. Um, yesterday, uh, Ambassador Saperstein was uh, speaking... Uh, ...stated that the largest roadblock we face in our quest for religious freedom is awareness of the issue itself. Um, I wanted to highlight a tool we've built to serve that exact purpose. I'm very proud of it and believe it will be useful for all of you here. Um, our persecution tracker is an online warehouse where research compile and record incidents of vigilante violence and state persecution, motivated by blasphemy and apostasy laws within the Muslim world. What is different about the persecution tracker is that it is human focused, highly accessible, we highlight the specific stories of persecuted individuals, give details on what happened to them, by whom, and the events that precipitated the incident. We aim to be exhaustive, not just highlighting the high-profile cases which gather media, garner media attention, but all cases. Additionally, we seek to follow up on what happened afterwards. Often in these cases, um, the consequences don't end even after they're released, even after they're able to flee. Um, one of the cases um, from Iraq, actually, uh, Ahmed Sharwan, he was a, a, a minor. He was sent to jail by his own family for being an atheist. When he got out, he was able to flee to Germany. He, while in Germany, he was attacked again for being an atheist. Um, currently, we have cataloged approximately 400 cases. We have a list view, which includes various filters uh, to search specific cases, specific countries, the act of persecution, but we also have an interactive map view where you can zoom into various parts of the world, see where uh, specific cases are happening, where areas uh, where the situation is most dire. <clears throat> every victim of persecution has their own story. We wanted to humanize, memorialize, and remind everybody about these cases. That's why we are very human-centered in this approach. Um, our cases involve, the cases we focus on involve atheists, secularists, liberals, religious minorities, even Muslims uh, that are persecuted. Um, a few examples of cases over here. Yamin Rashid was a blogger. He was murdered at, at his own apartment building. He was 29 years old. Um, he was from Maldives. Karim Amir, he was a seminary student in Egypt at Al-Azhar University. He spoke up about Islam and he was murdered. Sorry, he was jailed. Um, Farhunda Malikzada, a 27-year-old Afghan, Afghani woman was falsely accused of burning the Quran. She was run over, stoned, beaten, and her body was burnt. While many of the victims are currently in jail or did not survive the attacks, there are others that have and have fled to Western countries. One of our near-term goals is to speak with these individuals, reach out to them, get their testimony about their experiences, and incorporate that into the tracker itself. We also maintain country profiles, which, where we document the current blasphemy and apostasy laws and punishments in each country, the type of government, the environment of secularism, the environment of free speech. Um, the tracker is also unique in that it includes brief histories of the country's blasphemy laws, the origins of the blasphemy laws, and whether separation of church and state e exists and how closely tied is religion with the state itself. We have handouts available over here for, about the persecution tracker. Um, if you haven't got one, please get one on your way out. Um, thank you very much.
It's so great to use new technology um, in, in fresh ways in order to share this information. And I think so helpful going forward, just in the way that we're all globalized now, we're able to share this information and build an advocacy platform. So that's somebody who's not new um, to this issue is Ms. Ann Buwalda. Let me give a little background of her. She's in charge of the Jubilee campaign and responsible for the amazing um, uh, uh, side event that you've experienced here. From 1991 through the present time, Ann Buwalda has served as executive director of the Jubilee campaign of the USA, focusing on international religious freedom, advocating for the release of prisoners of conscience and resettlement of refugees, combating trafficking for the protection of children, and providing support to victims. In practice as a lawyer since 1992, Ann Bawalda founded a law firm, Just Law International PC, in March of 96, a firm handling all aspects of immigration law, including asylum and refugee cases. Ann, will you tie this all together for us? Well, thank you all for hanging in there with us uh, during the uh, actually very full and I think uh, excellently presented uh, seminar today. So what I am doing to tie this together, there has been a phone number up. You've been reminded of it, 555-855-549016. Yes, that number. <laughs> if you haven't gone to it, please do. Yes, and you have it memorized. The reason we're doing this is there needs to be international language that embeds specifically uh, to encourage countries to stop uh, the blasphemy and apostasy laws, the impact of them, and carrying out the death penalty as a result of them. So what we're trying to do is get this language embedded. And it's been quite an interesting journey in that effort. We've done um, several side events at the UN Human Rights Council. Um, most recently, the one in March, we did it at the Netherlands uh, consulate uh, in Geneva. And we had six countries sign on to the, to the idea of embedding the language. What we're trying to do now is to get civil society uh, organizations and individuals to also sign on. Uh, there are two UN uh, uh, treaties that we're trying to embed the language into. One is the UN General Assembly's uh, Treaty on Extrajudicial Killings. And we thankfully have 14 organizations that have signed on. If your organization has not, please do. The other one is the UN General Assembly moratorium on the death penalty generally that some groups uh, would sign on to the UN or UNGA extrajudicial um, uh, killings, but not the moratorium. We're happy if you sign on to one, both, we would appreciate both, but if you would just sign on to one, that would build momentum because certain NGOs such as Amnesty International have over the years essentially, are, they're stakeholders and they're considered by UN General Assembly um, countries involved as, as the ones who are sort of encouraging and you have to get through them to um, get this language embedded. Um, with that said, um, they're going to be more apt to in, in, in agree to that if we can actually get more uh, individuals, organizations, and countries to sign on. And so that's why we're encouraging the word to get out to please do this as an advocacy angle. Now, um, the, the UN General Assembly takes us up in the fall. They do it in their third committee of the General Assembly in New York. And so we're only have a couple of months left to be pressing this issue. And there's a couple of countries, for instance, that are on the brink. The Netherlands is on board completely. Uh, we have Sierra Leone, which is under discussion, Chile under discussion, uh, Germany under discussion. So, um, you know, if we can gain and grow momentum, we're hopeful that these countries will take it on and, and embed it. Now, um, where does the language that we're encouraging come from? It actually comes from um, the current US, I mean, UN uh, Secretary General. He has presented speeches, and um, there's also 
uh, special rapporteurs, several of them, um, who encourage language. If you would like, because you're a reader and really like reading boring uh, international language, we are happy to give you the exact language, the exact um, places we'd like to embed them. For the sake of time, I'm not going to dive into reading that to you. I'm sure you'll all go to sleep if I did. Um, but if you really, if your organizations need to take it seriously, if your board members of your organizations need to review it, we have these specific details of what we're trying to embed. And it's basically saying things like, um, ensuring that the death penalty never be imposed for nonviolent conduct, such as apostasy, blasphemy, or adultery. Everyone should be able to agree to that. Um, your faith choice should not lead to a death penalty for anyone. So, again, just one clause, ensuring that the death penalty never be imposed for nonviolent conduct, such as apostasy, blasphemy, or adultery. We're hopeful that this kind of language can get embedded into the, the two UNGA resolutions, and we ask for your support with that. Please um, dial into the number and put IRF. Thank you. We have reached the end. Thank you, everyone, um, so much for being here. So just to wrap it up, um, I will say, personally, it is my faith that compels me to recognize all people as made in the image of God and work fervently toward their right to believe and speak freely in a way that builds resilient, pluralistic communities. This was never more true to me than when I witnessed displaced Iraqi Christians serving Syrian Muslim refugee refugees inside of a tiny church in the Middle East. In his own words, Jesus Christ said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and set at liberty those who are oppressed. That's Luke 418. You might have seen um, Pastor Dr. Bob Roberts on stage, uh, on the main stage at the IRF Summit, and he is one of um, my heroes and the person who got me into this work. So as a reminder, um, I'm the policy director at the National Association of Evangelicals, and I think just by my very presence here, you know um, that we are very much in favor of all of the work that the IRF Summit is doing. So thank you once again. Um, that phone number is 855-549-549. Uh, 0168, you can text IRF to sign those charters. Thank you so much for being here.